Now, yeah, maybe uh, as a development economist, you could try and make a synthesis. Uh, where are we going to uh, from what we uh, have experienced uh, this, uh, this year and the previous uh, year? What are the structural trends that you see? Again, you are at the head of a network of economists globally. So you have a global view. Uh, can you share with us? Thank you, uh, Lionel. And let me also start by uh, thanking uh, Thierry and uh, the uh, WPC team for both for having me here and also for organizing this miracle. It is also for me the first time I take part in an in-person meeting over the last uh, two years. So it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's quite moving some extent. You ask me, Lionel, to reflect on the structural implications of COVID-19, and, and I would like to, to make five points. First, I think the pandemic has exposed a growing social unease toward complexity and uncertainty. And what I mean by that is that from the reactions that we observe from our public, people want to know what will happen. So we are always in a sort of uh, illusion of determinism. And even more, they expect governments to solve that uncertainty for them. And if the government says something and then changes mind because information has changed uh, over a space of, let's say, of one week or two weeks, then there is a strong critique about the inability of the governments to take decisions that would conform with the evolution. So one lose one big aspect of policy, which is precisely to manage shocks and uncertainty. This is not what the public expects. So this tension, I think, is at the core of some of the political difficulties that we observe during the crisis. I'm reminded of a book written by a Harvard psychologist called Daniel Gilbert. He wrote a book several years ago called Stumbling on Happiness, in which he related happiness to the lack of uncertainty about the future. And he said, what makes people unhappy is uncertainty about the future. Well, I think the pandemic has really powerfully demonstrated uh, uh, that. But at the same time, we all know that the pandemic is one of these unexpected, unknown shocks, but there will be more. So we need to uh, teach uh, our public that uncertainty is a part of life and we need to learn how to think about risk and to manage risk. To some extent, we need more financial reasoning about all these, uh, all these uh, issues. The uh, second uh, point I would like to mention uh, is that uh, we have had very encouraging policy and technology reactions. And the reason why we are here is precisely because in the face of these terrible pandemics, there were solutions, policy solutions and technical solutions. So in a way, we could be satisfied with that, except that we, uh, and, and this is related to the first point, we forgot that solutions create new problems. Solutions don't create a perfect world. So we are now talking about inflation and public debt, at least public debt from the point of view of developed countries. I'll say a word about developing countries because it's, I think the, 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 the external dimension of the debt is, 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 is a bigger issue. But these are, I mean, I prefer debt to death. So we were right to do what we did. It was a wonderful policy decision in the face of pre-existing rules that would have, in principle, prevented us from doing so, especially in Europe. We took the right decision, so now we can lament about the problems it creates. It's a fact of life. We are constantly dealing with problems that we created. So let's deal with the current debt and inflation problem. So let's start with inflation. I, I fully agree with my neighbor about inflation. We just don't know whether it will be transitory or permanent. We can follow it, monitor it very deeply, and there are indicators to do that. The indicators that may be the more relevant ones 
are trimmed inflation. You take, you take out of inflation the extreme price movements. Why? Because we know that these extreme price movements are related to a surge of growth after a big decline during the pandemics and uh, supply barrier and supply uh, constraints that may be transitory. If we look at trimmed inflation, we get a picture that is not that worrying. It requires monitoring and we can accommodate some more inflation. There is nothing in economics that tells you that 2% is better than 3%. What the economics will tell you is that if you go from 2 to 3 and then from 3 to 4 and then from 4 to 6, then you may have created a dynamics of inflation that is problematic. But the level of inflation itself is not per se the, the problem. So let's be realistic about that. We are managing the problem, central banks monitoring on a daily basis, and there is a number of people taking part in the debate that also contribute to that monitoring. Debt is a different subject because debt mixes moral arguments with economic arguments. And when people see debt increase, then they react from the moral argument and say, oh, that's bad. There are two things in debt that preoccupy me as an observer. One is this moral dominance of the judgment, and the second one is the ongoing inequity between debtors and creditors. Debtors are always wrong. They took debt. But when we say that, we forgot that for debt to exist, you also need creditors. So when there is excess debt, why should it be the fault of the debtor? It is also the fact that creditors lend too much. On the very specific issue of public debt, there is another very important dimension, which is that it is part of the savings investment balance. What would rich people do, and of inequality, by the way, what would rich people do if there was no public debt instruments to invest in? Well, they would invest right now in more speculative titles. And we know that it's a problem. So public debt is also one way to solve or to address this excess savings situation in which we are. And there are structural reasons for excess savings. One is the demography, but the other one is inequality. With inequality, you have a bigger distance between rich people and poor people, and rich people save more. So you have excess savings. And in a world where you don't have the investment, the private in productive investment opportunities, or people don't know them and they need to discover them, then that goes to speculative measures. So public debt is one way to restructure these excess savings from speculation to spending that can make sense socially. Therefore, the big issue about debt is not its level. It is the quality of public spending. And that leads me to the third point. The problem is that we don't know how to assess the quality of public spending. It's a judgmental behavior. And therefore, we try to replace that by quantitative rules. Well, the, and, and what COVID-19 has shown is that these quantitative rules don't work because they are not adapted to crisis situations. So in a way, we need to find something better to monitor debt than arbitrary criteria that, again, mean nothing from an economic point of view. They mean something from a management point of view. To avoid making mistakes, mistakes, let's control, let's put ceilings on the debt. Well, this is not adapted to a situation in which we have recurring shocks. So we need to find more, and that's one of the implications I draw, the fact that we need to think hard about the kind of rules that might be useful to help us manage these ongoing problems more successfully. The fourth implication is the necessary change in the value system. Lionel, you mentioned something which uh, struck me as, as very important. You say that in times of war and in times of crisis like this, we rediscover that what you call ordinary people play a big role in society. Yes, indeed, but this big role is not recognized by the economic, the market values. That's something that will have to change. And the, the other dimension of this crisis of values is, of course, environment, biodiversity, and climate. These are not well recognized by the market system. So, and in order for government policies to help, 
we need to have this ongoing, it has started to take place, change of values that will be a long-term thing, but it is also necessary uh, to, to see it uh, happen. The final uh, point I would like to make is about the power of globalization. Power in both the positive sense and the negative sense. In the negative sense, we saw it with the pandemic. It was really a globalized crisis, and there will be more. In the positive sense, there was a global response to it. I think we shouldn't underestimate the virtue of scientific and technical cooperation across countries. That continued to happen. So we have an example of uh, what Masoud Ahmed described in the first session, this tension between very powerful forces of globalization, and indeed the digital economy is one of them, the global public good is another very powerful globalization necessity. These questions we cannot solve on our side. We need a global response to climate change, to biodiversity protection, to security issues, and to the movement of persons, which indeed is the uh, weaker frontier uh, in this open economic world that we wanted to, to, to create. My only point there is that I believe that the management of globalization has to be based on politics. And it was, it was based on a high political agreement that took place after World War II, that was based on shared global values and the Cold War. That has exploded now. And the main reason for the difficulties are partly the US-China uh, conflict and the problems created by China's emergence and the uh, prospect of seeing China power grow up till 2049 and beyond. But it seems to me that one aspect of the crisis has a lot of bearings on the governance of globalization. It is a domestic dimension of the crisis and the lack of legitimacy of liberal democracies in our country. And that is something that uh, worries me uh, a lot, because I think that this uh, need to uh, find ways or a path toward a higher political debate around shared values in the world to anchor the future governance of globalization uh, requires uh, finding also shared values within countries. And this has become a political problem in all our societies. So there are some of the structural trends, some of them produced by COVID, some of them revealed by COVID, some of them pre-existing the COVID situation, but I think that they will uh, characterize uh, certainly uh, many of the political debates to come in the, in the future. Uh, Brodel was quoted this morning as mentioning that capitalists needed a patron. I do think personally that economics needs politics and that without a political framework, markets do not function. And I believe in markets. So I, the opposition between markets and politics for me is wrong-headed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre. Really, <coughs> it was very uh, much a synthesis and with great clarity. Mm -hmm.